Good morning. I've got a challenge for all of y'all. Uh, as we're going through this 15 weeks of uh, uh, study of Proverbs. And did you know that the book of Proverbs has 31 <clears throat> chapters in it? And that in a month, if you start day one and read chapter one, and read, you can read through the whole book in a month. And so tomorrow is, what, the 20th? I want to encourage you to start in Proverbs chapter 20 and begin reading uh, that. And then that next day... And go on through. If you do that, you'll be able to read through the book of Proverbs two or three times uh, by the time we get through this series. And I I think if we do that, we'll all be a little bit wiser for it. Now, let me ask you a question. Would would you agree that relationships with people can be really hard? Especially when you've got to confront somebody about something. You've got to bring up a problem you're having with somebody. And you're just not sure how they're going to react to it. Maybe somebody works for you and he's a, a good worker, but he's got this critical spirit that just is acting like a poison, just affecting your whole, whole workplace. And, and you need to confront him about this, but how do you do it in such a way that, that it doesn't make a bad situation even worse? You love your husband, but he's beginning to drink more and more. And you're getting concerned that it's starting to affect not only his home life, but his work life. And you, and you need to say something, but how do you do that? You love your mother to death, but she has this irritating habit of making snide comments about your wife. And your wife has had it, and she doesn't want to go to your parents' house anymore, and it's just this ongoing problem. So what do you say to your mother that's going to, in a way, that's not going to erupt into World War III. You've got an uncle who, who used to go to casinos occasionally, but now he's doing it all the time. And he's losing more and more money, and, and you're worried about him. How do you approach him to talk about his problem that he's having with gambling? Is there any hope for these relationships? I mean, will those confrontations just end up blowing up in your face? Well, Proverbs 24, 14 says that when we acquire wisdom, we have hope for the future. And if there's ever an area in which we definitely need wisdom, it's in this area of relationships with people. And in order to have hope in future relationship, any future relationship that we're having a struggle in, we need God's wisdom to know what to do. Now, so far in our series in Proverbs, we've seen that wisdom includes being moral and good, but it's more than that. And we said that wisdom is the skillful art of living. Wisdom is knowing the right thing to do and the varying situations and and decisions you've got to make. They're not specifically spelled out for us in God's Word. My friend, Dr. Henry Cloud, has an extremely helpful chapter on uh, relationships in his book, Necessary Endings. And in that chapter, he talks about three different kinds of people that we find in Proverbs, and there's three very different ways to deal with each of these three types of people. Now, with Henry's permission, I'm very excited to share some of his insights uh, with you this morning. And if you're interested in hearing more of his insights, it's chapter 7 of Necessary Endings. Okay, the first thing we need to understand then is this. You cannot deal with everybody in the same way. Can't deal with everybody in the same way. And here's the problem. Okay, I want to see a raise of hands. How many of you are nice people? You see? Yeah. Okay, yeah, all right, that's good. Okay, now let's see another raise of How many of you are not nice people? No, just kidding. Now, here's why I ask that question. If you are basically a nice person, Well, you tend to treat people nicely. And so if a friend of yours comes up and he's got a problem with you about something and and, and he says, you know, you told me you were going to come help me move Saturday and and you didn't show up. And not only that, you didn't even call me and let me know you weren't coming. And my feelings were really hurt. So nice person that you are, you would listen to what your friend has to say. A nice person you are, you would talk about that problem with him, and you'd apologize for letting him down, and you would make a serious effort not to do that same thing to him ever again. So being a nice person, when you have to go to somebody else with a problem, you naturally expect 
you assume that they're going to respond in the exact same way that you responded to your friend. And you expect them, you know, when you go to them with a problem, you expect them to listen to what you have to say. And you expect them uh, to talk with you about it and uh, sincerely try to change whatever negative or bad or destructive uh, behavior was really bugging you. Here's the problem. Everybody's not a nice person. Did everybody figure that out? Everybody's not a nice person. Different kinds of people, you know, respond to criticism in very different ways. And so, in order to have hope in relationships, you need to have different strategies for dealing with different kinds of people. Different strategies. Okay, as we turn to the book of Proverbs, Solomon talks about these three different kinds of people. Here they are. They're wise people, fools, and evil people. Wise people, fools, and evil, evil people. Now, what motivates each of these three kinds of people to change Again, it's very, very different. Now listen, I make this promise right at the start. If you try to deal with a fool the same way that you deal with a wise person, you're going to be extremely frustrated. You're going to be just at your wit's end with that person. And if you try to deal with an evil person the way that you deal with a wise person, you could be in serious danger, maybe even for your life. I'm not kidding so let's take a look then at these three different kinds of people. And let's see, let's see for each one of these three, what they're like and what kind of strategy works best to have a good relationship with that person. Okay, first of all, let's look at wise people. Wise people, what are they like? Well, this might surprise you, but really wise people, they may not be the smartest or the most talented person in the room. You know, wise does not necessarily mean the brightest, the smartest. It doesn't necessarily mean the most gifted or the most charming person around. In fact, what we're going to see, that it's very possible, in fact, highly likely, we will have to deal with some really smart, charming fools who are really good at fooling you. No, here's what, here's what a wise person is like in a relationship. When the light shows up revealing an area of darkness in their lives, when they're confronted with the truth, you know, when you give them honest feedback, when you tell them about some hurtful behavior of theirs, the wise person, what does he do? He takes it in. He takes it in. And he makes the changes that he needs to make. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. All right, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. When a, when a wise person, when you confront them about a problem that you're having with them, instead of being defensive, they listen. They listen. Listen to what Proverbs 9, verses 8 and 9 says. It says, do not rebuke a mocker. Mocker is just a synonym, another word for fool in the Proverbs. Do not rebuke a mocker or he will hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Instruct a wise man and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will add to his learning. So if you've got an issue with somebody, you've got a problem with somebody, what does the Bible say? Matthew 18 says, well, you go to that person, you talk with that person about that problem. You do not go with another person and talk to them about that problem you're having with that person. No, you go directly straight to that person. So you got a problem with a wise person, you come to him with a problem, and, and all of a sudden, huge defensive walls don't go flying up. The wise person actually listens. He listens to what you say. And do you know why the wise person listens to your, your confrontation? Because if he's done anything wrong, if he's done anything hurtful, he wants to know about it. He wants to learn from it. He, he wants to do something to change that, that hurtful behavior. How does a wise person respond? They own the problem. They own the problem. In other words, they don't try to shift the blame off to somebody else. They don't go on these long-winded explanations about how it couldn't possibly be their fault, and, and they basically, you know, they don't try to kill the messenger. No, they own it. They own it. They respond with something like, really? I, I, I didn't really realize that, but now that you mention it, I can really see what you're talking about. And not only do wise people listen and own the problem, they also are genuinely sorry about the way that they've hurt you. Wow, I'm so sorry I didn't help you move. You, you were counting on my help, weren't you? I let you down. I am really sorry. 
And not only do wise people listen, and not only do they own the problem, and not only are they sorry about it, also they are willing to make adjustments and change hurtful behavior to make things better. They're willing to make adjustments, tweak themselves. They're willing to change hurtful behavior in order to make things better. In other words, a wise person, you know what they do? They learn from their mistakes. They learn from them. And they don't let those mistakes, you know, become a, a pattern of behavior in their lives. Instead, they work on changing that behavior so they won't make that same mistake over and over and over again with you and with everybody else. Here's something absolutely wonderful about confronting a wise person. Here it is. They thank you for coming to them. They say something like, thank you for telling me that. You know, it, it hurts a little bit, but, but it helps me to know that I'm coming across that way. I, I, really, I really didn't know that. Thank you. They say stuff like, you know, I really took to heart what you said to me last week. I thought about it, and I, I just want to let you know, here's what I've done about it. Or they say something like, you know, thanks for caring for me enough to bring this to my attention. It's something I really needed to hear. Thanks for being such a good friend. And guess what? You come to the wise person with a problem you're having with him or her, and you talk about it, and your relationship with them is strengthened, not weakened. It's strengthened. Proverbs 9, 8 says, rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. You know, you're, you'll be closer than ever with that person, that relationship. Whatever that problem was that was standing between you and them, that was separating you, it, it's going to get resolved with that wise person, and there's nothing any longer standing between you. Therefore, you're all the stronger. You love each other even more. You know, Henry does a lot of leadership training and consulting with uh, different uh, business organizations. And in his book, uh, Necessary Endings, he shares a time about when he was hired by a particular company and the, the chairman of the board was asking him to come into the office and kind of uh, consult and advise, but particularly he wanted Henry to help him in knowing how to effectively confront this CEO in the organization. Now, this CEO, man, he had a lot of good strengths. He had a lot of good qualities. But the chairman was just concerned that this guy just didn't have a clear enough vision for how to lead that, that company into the future. So Henry and the CEO and this uh, chairman of the board, they sit down in the chairman's office. And the chairman, immediately you could tell this is not going to be a pleasant conversation, okay? And he starts to list. You know, I appreciate this and that, but... You know, these are the concerns I have about you being a CEO in our company. And Henry said, boy, listening to it, it sounded like the guy was get, getting ready to fire him. He really didn't do a great job. But so Henry's just kind of, oh, boy, bracing. This is going to be bad. He's bracing himself for the CEO's response. And Henry says this, quote, what happened next literally caused my eyes to water. The CEO looked up, nodded slowly and said, you have just given a great list of the things that I need to learn how to do to be a great CEO. Those are definitely my opportunities to grow. I'd like to get better in those areas. Can you guys help me? You see, it blew Henry away because he knew instantly that he was in the presence of a wise man. You see, there's hope for people who are receptive to feedback. There's hope for people who are willing to take ownership of where they need to grow. That's how a wise person functions in relationships. So what's the strategy then? How do we deal with a wise person when you've got a problem with them? The strategy is talk. You talk to them. You know why? Because talking with a wise person is very productive. And what it does, it helps resolve problems and clear up issues that are standing between you. So you talk and you continue to invest in that relationship. Henry and the chairman, uh, after that response, uh, he, they invested. They took some time to train and give him some structures and show him some ways to, to, to accomplish these things. And he learned and he grew and he became an excellent CEO for that company. So with a wise person, then you talk, you continue to pour your life into that person, and that relationship will deepen and it will grow. Okay, let's move on then to category number two, foolish people. Foolish people. Again, 
Proverbs 9, 8 warns us, whoever corrects a mocker or a fool invites insult. Insult. What's a fool like? Well, when you confront them about a problem you're having with them, instead of listening, they get defensive. Boom! Boy, there are the walls of defense go flying up. And you confront a fool, and you bring light to his hurtful behavior, and guess what? The light hurts his eyes. He doesn't like it at all. First thing he wants to do, turn out that light. So they get real defensive, and they start attacking you. They don't want that light. They don't want to see their, what's wrong with them. They get real defensive. You see, the fool thinks he's never wrong. Never wrong. And the fool, you know what he'll do? He will just go to the mat fighting you to convince you you are crazy for thinking that about him. And so what do they do? They reject all feedback. Just dismiss it completely. And they resist. Anything you try, any reason you try to, they just resist. They explain it away, explain their own behavior. And, and you know, they, they, just, they just don't do that. And if, if you're sitting next to a fool this morning, don't take that up with them right now, okay? I, I think it's going to be very interesting lunch discussions, you know. Uh, so, but but you, do that later. Let's just learn what, what the scriptures have to say first. But, but seriously, you know, it is. And we all know this. It, it's very, very frustrating confronting a fool about something. Why? Because they take no ownership of the problem. None. Zero. Zip. Instead, they blame others. Have you ever noticed that when you're dealing with a fool, the problem's never in the room? It's always out there somewhere. You know, it's somebody else. It's somebody else. It's not me. Oh, it's not me. It's somebody else's fault. Always. And another way a fool responds to constructive criticism is they minimize the problem. Look, the fact that I came home late for dinner for the 10th time, I mean, what are you so upset about? That's not that big of a deal. You're just making a mountain out of a molehill. Come on, just warm the food up and we'll eat it for crying out loud. Minimizing the problem. And they rationalize their offense. In other words, they'll tell you rational lies about how completely off base you are to dare accuse them of such a thing. Now, is the fool sorry about the way that he's hurt you? No, not a bit. They show no remorse for how they have hurt you. And you know why they don't show any remorse or feelings for, how, for your feelings? Because they're way too busy defending themselves to be thinking about how they might have hurt you. That's preoccupied them. And, and is the fool going to make any changes to, get, to make things better? Don't count on it. Don't count on it. They aren't willing to adjust or work on changing their own hurtful behavior. Just not willing to do it. And consequently, that hurtful behavior is repeated over and over and over and over again. And it becomes, if you're not careful, a repeating pattern of behavior. And you're going to have that same futile conversation with that person for 64 times. The fool doesn't learn from his mistakes. And that's sad. You know why? Because he never grows never grows never gets better and does the fool thank you for bringing his selfish sinful hurt behavior to your attention not exactly not exactly no they are angry at you for confronting them and, and become resentful towards you angry resentful and the talk you know you're talking to the fool is inevitably going to turn into an argument and with these kind of folks, you know, you're, the relationship is not going to be strengthened. It's going to be weakened. Slowly but surely, it's going to weaken until, you know what, it's possible for that relationship just to die. And just because a person's a fool, it doesn't mean he's dumb. It doesn't mean he's lacking in talent. In fact, in many cases, he may be the smartest and most talented person at the table. And she can usually, man, talk circles around you and be extremely convincing about her complete, 100% total innocence. When you, are, when you confront a fool, it's not long before you start to feel just completely hopeless about that relationship. And you've got, you're having that same conversation. You're dealing with that same issue over and over again, and you get Nowhere. Nothing changes whatsoever, and your frustration will eventually to turn into just utter despair. You see, the fool's goal, what he's really after, whether he realizes it or not, 
is to avoid ownership of his own hurtful behavior. And here's why. If the fool owns it, if he admits that he really does have that problem, then he'll actually have to take responsibility for it. And if he takes responsibility for it, it means he's going to have to make some changes, and the fool is not interested at all in making changes. No, he wants you to change. He's happy the way he is. He doesn't want to change. Now, now that we're all completely depressed out of our minds, what is the strategy for dealing with, with, with fools? Well, here's the strategy. You've all heard the definition of insanity, haven't you? you? You've heard this. Insanity is when you continue to do the same action over and over again and expect a different result. That, that's insanity. Crazy people do that. Well, guess what? Talking to a fool, it'll drive you crazy. It really will. So the strategy, here it is. Here's, you ready for, it? ready for it? The strategy is stop talking about the problem. You heard me. Stop talking about the problem. Now, if you've had this conversation 63 times, do you really think conversation number 64 is going to work? Are you serious? What would make you think that saying it again would do any good? Now, the fool, really, actually, he wants you to keep talking. He loves to talk. You know why? Because it doesn't make him change. Just talking does not require a fool to change. So here's the big thing. Here's the big shift that some of you have got to make, all of us have got to make, in dealing with fools. Here it is. You've got employees, you know, you've talked to about changing things, so you're blue in your face and you're sick of it. And you've got family members, you've talked to, you're blue in the face and nothing changes. So what do you do? Number one, you stop talking about the problem. And number two, you start talking about the new problem. Start talking about the new problem. So what's the new problem that we need to start talking about? The new problem to start talking about is that talking doesn't help doesn't help. And what we need to do is to change the conversation from trying to get them to change to talking about the fact that, hey, no change is happening, and that is the problem. So you come up to the fool, and you, and you say, you know, you know how I've talked to you repeatedly about your addiction uh, or about your rageaholic driving or, or about, your, about spending more money than we have in our bank account or about screaming at the kids and terrorizing, whatever the issue is. You come up, you know, you say, I, I don't want to talk about that anymore. I'm done. It's over. And the fool will stare at you incredulously, wondering what alien being has inhabited your body of the person he wants knew. Because you've never responded that way before, okay? And then you say, you know, I want to talk to you about how talking is just not healthy. And I need to do something different. I need to do something different. And you're going to say, you know, I'm not going to talk to you anymore about you changing because I realize that I now have to make some changes, and here they are. Boom, boom, boom. And then what you do is you set limits, and you establish consequences. Limits, consequences. Those are the golden words. Sam, if you miss another deadline, I'm going to replace you. Mary, since you continue to charge more on the credit card uh, than we can ever afford to pay, I've canceled the credit card. Son, since you're not able to meet the curfew that I've, uh, I've set for you uh, on Saturday nights, you know, your driving privileges have been suspended for a month. Give me the keys. Dave, I want to live in a sober house really do. And, and since you have chosen to not do anything about your addiction, I won't be living with you anymore until you get treatment and get sober. Now, here are some tips in setting these limits. First of all, be very specific, very specific. You don't say, I'm sick and tired of you being so irresponsible. That's just more talk. Has that gotten you anywhere? No. Instead, you need to carefully Get advice on this from, from uh, someone. Uh, carefully, thoughtfully, prayerfully set up very specific, very clear limits and consequences. In setting limits, this is crucial. This is really important. Make a star by this one. Don't do it in anger. You don't yell. You don't scream. You don't raise your voice. You don't have to have that angry, I hate you look on your face. Totally not necessary. Man, that guy's counterproductive. You set limits in a very calm a very unemotional, a very deliberate way. And guys, here's something that absolutely has to change in order for all this to work. We have to shift the need to change. 
we have to shift the need to change. In other words, you feel that the fool needs to change. You feel that the fool, fool needs to pay his bills, that the fool needs to quit screaming at the kids, that uh, he needs to, you feel he needs to quit gambling. You feel he needs to get in a treatment program. You feel that, but the fool, oh, he doesn't feel he needs to change. I'm fine. I'm happy. What's your problem? So here's all you got to do. You got to shift the need to change off of your shoulders and onto the shoulders of the only person who can do anything about it, the fool. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like the way, you know, we, we got to treat our kids and raise our kids. You know, when, when parents say to their children, you need to do your homework. You need to clean up your room. Well, obviously the kid doesn't feel that need. He feels the need to watch TV. You know, he feels, he feels the need to live in a, a messy. He likes messy. He's comfortable in messy. He likes messy. He doesn't feel any need whatsoever to do that. But if the parent says, you know what, we're going to go uh, to the lake house this weekend and a really incredible place. I'm down at Fouchon. We're going to fish. We're going to do some great stuff. And, and, and if your room is cleaned up, you get to go with us. Won't that be fun? But, you know, if your room's not cleaned up, remember Mabel? Remember the Mabel, the babysitter that locked you in the room for three days? You're going to spend the whole weekend with her. So the kid remembers Mabel. Oh. And all of a sudden, voila, transformation takes place. Lo and behold, Junior feels the need to clean up his room. And see what has happened? The parents have shifted the need to change off of their shoulders and onto Junior's sh shoulders. And here's the key. The consequences have to be painful enough to make the fool want to change his behavior. Now, is that being mean? Is that being unchristian? No, that's being loving. In fact, the most unloving thing we can possibly do is to enable the fool to continue to do foolish things unchecked. And when we enable them and they have no consequences, we're just, we're just asking for more of the same. Well, let me, let me say something encouraging about, about this, and this is, here it is. There is hope for fools. There really is. It is possible that when a fool is stung by the limits and stung by the consequences you've set, that it will all of a sudden open their eyes to their problem, their problem. And it can give them the motivation that they need in order to take responsibility for themselves and start working on changing that behavior. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See those two kinds of sorrows? Worldly sorrow, godly sorrow, contrasted, very different. You know, worldly sorrow, you feel really badly because you got caught. That's the only reason you feel bad. Uh, but, and you're not willing to change, so nothing changes. You do nothing about it. That's worldly sorrow. You can tell you, oh, I'm so sorry, but you see what happens if it's worldly or godly. With godly sorrow, you are convicted about your selfish and hurtful ways. And by golly, you do something about it. You, you repent. Repent means you just completely change your mind about it. You own it, and you make the necessary steps to change your behavior. Okay, that's the wise person. That's the foolish person. Now we've got two-thirds of the world figured out. Isn't that great? Okay, let's go ahead and get the last third. There's one more category, and that is evil people. Evil people. You know, we read about evil people in verses like Proverbs 24, verses 1 and 2, where it says, do not envy wicked men. That's an evil person. Do not desire their company. Why? For their hearts plot violence, and their lips talk about making trouble. Proverbs 9, 7, whoever rebukes a wicked man incurs abuse. So what's an evil person like? Well, first of all, they want to hurt you. They want to hurt you. You know, the fool may hurt you, but really it's unintentional. You know, the main thing for the fool is just avoiding personal responsibility for their own actions. An addict, believe it or not, He's not trying to wreck your home. Sometimes they do because it's a collateral damage for them fighting so hard to avoid the light at any cost. But that's not their real intention. That's not their goal in life. 
But an evil person, an evil person, they want to hurt you. They're out there, guys. They're out to get you. They, they, it's intentional. I mean, it's not accidental. It's intentional. They plot. They plan. They scheme how to make your life miserable. They want you to suffer. They want you to hurt. They're not reasonable, so don't even try to reason with these people. They like to bring others down. They love it when you fail. They are so happy when you fall. You know, they enjoy dividing and destroying churches and friendships and families and businesses. In short, these folks, they are dangerous, really dangerous. So what's the strategy? Well, with wise people, you talk to them. With foolish people, you don't talk to them and you start setting some limits and some consequences. Henry says that with evil people, the strategy is lawyers, guns, and money. I think that was the name of a song or something. But it's a funny thing, but he's serious. He's serious. The strategy is, number one, don't talk to them at all. Don't need to talk to these people. Spend some money and let your lawyer do the talking. Protect yourself. You go into protection mode because you've got to protect yourself. And sometimes it does take guns, especially if you're a woman, especially if you become involved with a charming but deceptive evil man, especially if you're married to an evil man who's a rageaholic and has physically abused you. Your life might depend on whether or not that policeman carrying the gun can get to your house in time. Of course, God can change anybody. You need to understand, just, just look at history. Just look at look around. Evil people rarely change. You need to understand that. You can hope for it, you can pray for it, but they rarely change. Now, let me cl- close with a very important word of caution. And here it is. Caution. None of this will do any good whatsoever if we are fools. Won't work. Just toss it out the window. It's not going to work if you're a fool. And the truth is, you know, all of us at times act like fools. You know, we do. For crying out loud, we were born fools. Everybody is born a fool. That's why the proverb says, you know, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And the whole process of parenting, you know what parenting is? It's taking your little foolish darling and transforming them into a wise person. That's the goal. That's what you want to do as a parent. Now, I am a recovering fool like all of you. And I know that there are certainly times when I have been defensive when criticized. Please don't ask Julie about this. It's just between us, okay? And and sometimes I try to blame someone or something else for my behavior. And sometimes I have a hard time owning the problem. And look, we've all do that. We've all acted foolishly at times. But here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. We've got to understand this. If that foolish behavior becomes a consistent pattern in your life, that's the way you normally usually act, then you're not just acting like a fool. You are a fool. You are a fool. And and you know what? That's become a part of your character. So it's very important, guys, very important for every one of us to work on becoming a wise person ourselves. And it takes work. It really does. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 7 when he said, said this. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you've got a log in your own? How can you think of saying, hey, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log from your own eye, and then perhaps you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So what that says, guys, every one of us, every, there's no exception to this, every single one of us need to be in a process of spiritual growth and development. We've got to be. We've got to be in this process of learning to become a wise person. And, of course, you know where that begins. If you were here last week, you know what, what the beginning of wisdom is? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. And we fear we talk, that's not being scared and cowering in fear. It's talking about, hey, he's got the rightful place in our lives. Fearing the Lord is that he is at the very center of our lives, not just floating around in the periphery. He's he's at the center. Fearing God, that means you are cultivating a, a daily love relationship with him. And here's what that's important. As you grow, 
as you mature in the Lord, you become humble enough to address your own logs. Humble enough to address your own logs are sticking out of your eyes. So rather from rather than running from our problems, you know, rather than, than living in complete denial of our own shortcomings and our own hurtful behaviors, we join David in the Psalms when he prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way ever. That's a wise person talking there. He wants to know if there's something going on in here that shouldn't be going on, and he wants to change it. And one more important thing is this. This is also very important. Have some wise people in your life who care enough about you to confront you when there is a problem. Got to have some wise people in your life to confront you when you're having a problem. You know, I love the song we sang this morning, You Alone, and, and, and it's true but not completely true. You alone are all I need. No, it's not all you need. The Bible never talks about just all you need. It's this vertical relation with God. It's just you and God. Just you. No, it, it includes God. That's important. But it also includes all of you. It includes your brothers and sisters in Christ. And God uses people. God is in each of you talking, helping, confronting, exhorting, encouraging others. We've got to have other people in our lives. In fact, I could go so far to say it's, it's, it's foolish and it's futile to try to be a wise person on your own. It just doesn't happen. That's just not the way God set it up. So what we need, we need some wise, we need some caring, we need some loving people who are going to not only give us tender love when we need it, but also going to give us that tough love as well. And that's what Proverbs 27, 6 talks about, where it says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You see, a real friend loves you enough to confront you with a problem that's, that's going on in your life. And here's the question, and I'll leave it with this. Here's the question. When confronted, will you respond like a wise person or will you respond like a fool? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your enormous patience with us foolish people. And Father, we just confess this morning that, that uh, we act more like a fool than, than we care to admit. And that, Lord, we, we have a lot of pride or we have a lot of inferiority. And so when somebody comes to us with a problem, we just fight it tooth and nail. So, Father, we just pray that you can help us grow in this area. Oh, Father, I pray for each and every person in this room that we can be wise people. Well, that we can have a genuine desire to grow, even if that means addressing and dealing with some dark areas in our lives. Father, we thank you that you are the God of all wisdom. And you're the God of all comfort. And Lord, you're there and, and that you care and you want to give us wisdom. You want to help us to make those right decisions and those, those times when we're really not sure what to do. And so, Father, I pray for relationships. Lord, maybe there's some strained relationships uh, going in and uh, in the lives of people here with other people. God, may you use your word, these Proverbs, Father, to, to help those relationships to not to stay the same, not to get worse, but to get better. Father, we, we just acknowledge we can't do this on our own. We desperately need you. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us instruction. You've given us wisdom. Now, Father, we ask you to give us the courage and you give us the strength to put these things in practice. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.